So we're all excited. <laughs> Some of us are excited. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like I'm excited. <laughs> so we're starting. I've got a slide for it, Moses. I don't know whether you, you've got it. I don't know whether you saw the Facebook page. We did, we did a bit of a we did a post on it. We're starting the Book of Romans. Start the Book of Romans. And I don't know about you, but every time I try to read the Book of Romans, or have read the Book of Romans, I should say, I do feel that like there are parts of it that are like tongue, tongue twisters. Have you ever experienced that you read it? Just like, I'm sure, is it me or is it, is this a little bit, it's just the word in the way that it's structured and it, it's an amazing book. And I love the book of Romans and it is so fundamental to what we believe. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a back story as to how it came about, who's written to, I hope it worked out that it's written to the people in Rome. Because that's what it's called Romans. And um, so here we have a church that is in Rome. This incredible city is the center of obviously the Roman Empire. And here we have the Apostle Paul writing to them from Corinth. So he is on his third missionary journey. If you're with us when we did the book of Acts, remember that Paul he had three missionary journeys and he traveled all over what is now Turkey and Greece and Syria and Macedonia, these places, and he planted churches. And he was planning a fourth missionary journey. He was planning on going further west because there was already a church established in Rome, and I'll explain how that came about in a minute. And he was heading to Spain. He was heading further west, he's heading for Spain. He's, his mind is on new fertile ground where he can take the gospel. But he needs some help. And that is what the letter to Romans is about. He's right in the head to the church in Rome to introduce himself. And amazingly enough, the letter of, of the, the, the letter to the Romans is an incredible. Christian CV of Paul's beliefs. And we have it here in great detail. And because this man was so intelligent, but understood the Christian beliefs so much, we have it in so much detail. And probably most of the questions that we have about our faith, you'll probably find the answer in the book of Romans. It's, it's literally, Paul has laid out for us what we need to do. You might think the book of Romans is irrelevant, and yet it could, couldn't be more relevant than it is today. Paul was in a world that was pre-Christian. The church was just getting started. He was 25 years into ministry at this point. Can you believe that? 25 years into ministry? And he's planning on a new campaign. He's planning a new campaign. New fertile ground. And he makes his plans and he starts making preparations and he sends this letter ahead of himself. So we know it's written by Paul. The church in Rome. Where did it come from? This is the amazing thing about these churches because we think in our minds that Paul must have planted all the churches and he didn't. The church in Rome was probably birthed out of the day of Pentecost. So here you have all these people from all over the, the, the known world, from the empire, if you like, all the Jews that come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And some of them are still about when Pentecost happens, when there's a great outpouring of the Spirit of God is when the church really launched. God came in great power and launched this amazing thing called the church. So they go back to Rome. These Jews go back to Rome. And they start the Roman church. They start the Roman church and that's, that's what happens. And then something weird happens. There was a quirk in history. The emperor at the time, I think it was Claudius, in Rome, sometime between Pentecost and by the time 
Paul wrote this letter, he kicked all of the Jews out of Rome. So those that started the church were told to get out, you have to leave. And all that was left were the non-Jews, the Gentiles, people like us. People that didn't have that Jewish background, they didn't understand about Abraham and Isaac. And all that they've been through, and the promised land, and all of these things, they didn't get it. Because it wasn't part of their heritage. And that's who was left. So the church goes into a new phase. When it's run by those that are left, those that were with Jews. And then the Jews are allowed back, and all of a sudden everything's changed. The church has changed. And you can understand that that would cause some conflict. The leaders now are not Jews. For us today, it, it doesn't make sense. It's like, of course, the leaders were Jews, because it would be like it is today, surely. But we forget that it was the Jewish people that started the church. And we forget that. So the Jews come back, and there's this great conflict in the church in Rome. And this letter, not only is it a CV, of Paul, it helps to address the problems they have in Rome. As always, Paul is trying to help to bring together unity of the church. Unity is so important in the church. Paul's been a little bit selfish here in his mission because he thinks if, if I come and the church is in chaos, how are they going to help me with my mission? So he's trying to address some of the issues and hopefully by the time he gets there, they'll sort themselves out. It's interesting, isn't it? It's just like, well, send a letter, hopefully that'll, that'll just cure everything. I've got to be honest, I've never seen that happen, but it was uh, it's certainly a really good letter. And I hope that it solved some of their issues, but unity is something so difficult to achieve, isn't it? So difficult to achieve. I don't know, have you, have you been watching The Chosen? Have you, have you seen that? Yeah, I'm a great fan of that show. And it just, it's showing the life of Jesus, but it's, 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 it makes it in a real way. But, but one of the things that, that kind of jumps out to you is the conflict with the disciples. Mm-hmm. The, the, the kind of jockey position. And you can see this. Unity in the church is very, very difficult to achieve. To be all of one mind, going in one direction. Very difficult to achieve. But this is what Paul is attempting through his letter. But Paul has an issue. Or rather, everyone has an issue with Paul. And we can take something from this. After 25 years of ministry, he's still an outsider. So he goes to Jerusalem. He's been collecting money from all of the churches that he started and he's got this great collection and he's on his way to Jerusalem to give it to the church in Jerusalem where Peter is, James and John, and we read that, don't we? He arrives there and he gives them the collection. He's still an outcast. They don't trust him. The Jews don't trust him. The Gentiles don't trust him because he's too Jewish. It's ironic, isn't it? Have you ever been in a situation where you just don't fit in? Yeah, I, I, I've been there, I've got to be honest, and you just feel like, is it just me? Or is everyone mad? <laughs> I feel like on a daily basis, I have to say. But Paul didn't fit in either camp. He didn't fit in either camp. He'd been gone for 20, 25 years, that's a long time. To be in ministry. He'd been in prison, he'd been stoned, he'd, he'd suffered so much shipwreck. There's all these things that have happened to him. And he gets to Jerusalem. And it must be that the, this feeling of just not fitting in. Because he was called by Jesus. He wasn't called like we were called, as in responding to a message. Jesus came to him on the road to Damascus and his calling is almost unique. Jesus stopped in his tracks. 
Because he was persecuted. And remember, he was Saul, wasn't he? He was Saul and he was this educated man who was going to destroy the church. Jesus stopped him. For 25 years, he'd, he completely reversed the way he was going. And for 25 years, he'd been serving Jesus obediently. Giving everything he had. And they still wouldn't accept him. That's hard, isn't it? That's hard. But here we have this great book, this letter. I'm going to read some of it to you. And we have to understand that this is our doctrinal statement. This book. You want to know what we believe or what we should believe? Is in here. So we read it. So it's Romans 1. Verses 1 to 7. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, calls to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand, before his prophets, before and through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, regarding his son, who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David. And through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God, empowered by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also were among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who are left by God and called to be his holy people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What an opening statement. We just have do your job, don't we? That's the best we can do, isn't it? Do your job. Do your weather. Do you know what I mean? But here, Paul, he gives this amazing opening statement. But I love the first thing he says about himself. Paul, a servant. The amazing thing is, is the word that he uses in Greek is doulos. And the word means slave. It doesn't even mean servant. We, we have this, this picture of what a servant is. He's not saying servant, he means slave. Now slavery has a certain connotation to it, doesn't it? You, you think of slave and you just think, well, he must be held in chains. Someone is holding him there against his will. And this is the amazing thing is Paul is saying, no, you misunderstand. You totally misunderstand. I am a slave to Jesus. Why? Because I have attached myself to him. I have decided to attach myself to him. He didn't chain me. I have attached myself to him. Where he goes, I follow. I am a slave to Jesus. Out of choice. And that's a question for us, isn't it? Have we attached ourselves to Jesus? Or are you attaching yourself to someone else? Are you attaching yourself to men or women? People who maybe we look up to. It's a natural thing, isn't it? We naturally do it. We look to people. And Paul says, no. I have attached myself to Jesus. Because he's worthy. You see, Paul only saw him after the resurrection. Remember I said that something changed at the resurrection? Jesus is now in his glory. Not like any other man or woman. Jesus revealed his glory to Paul. 
and stopped him in his tracks. And from that moment, Paul says, I will follow you all the days of my life. I don't know about you, but I've been a little bit hot and cold, on and off, in my Christian walk. I think if we're honest, we're all a little bit up and down, aren't we? And there are times when I've been more down than that. And I'm sure Paul had his bad days. I'm sure there were times when Paul felt like giving up. I'm sure there were times when he must have thought, why have they still not accepted me? But he wasn't attached to them. He was attached to him. And that is the question that I have you. Who are you attached to? What are you connected to? What is it? What is it that pulls you to life? Because as Jesus moves, as God moves, as he starts to unlock his plans and purposes, are you so attached to him that naturally you follow him? Because that's the question, isn't it? Are you attached to him so that when he moves, you follow him? Not as a matter of choice. You've already made your choice. But when God moves, you follow because you're attached to him. To be attached to Christ. But we have to make that choice, that submission to attach ourselves to him. To say, where you go, I will follow. done that? Have you done that? Maybe you need to do that this morning. Where you go, I will follow. It's quite profound, isn't it? You know, one of the issues in our society, and I've said this many times, is the theology of self. We all have a relationship with God. And we say it's our personal relationship with God, and there's nothing wrong with that, and that's fine. But if we're not careful, we miss the truth. That God sent his son to die for the whole world. He didn't die for you. He did collectively, but he didn't just die for you, he died for the world. John 3.16. I'm not making it up. The theology itself is the problem with our society. It's the problem with the church today. We're so wrapped up in me, we've forgotten what service is. We've forgotten to serve one another. In a way where it might hurt us. It might cost us. Paul has done this for 25 years. It has cost him everything. Everything he had before. He even changes his name. Because what he had before is not the same. He's given everything up. He probably would have ended up being. I don't know whether you realise this. He probably would have been the high priest eventually. He was being prepared for office in the temple. But he gave it all up to serve Jesus. And he spent years planting churches and bringing people to faith. Because he saw the big picture. He saw more than himself. And this is the problem with the church. All we see is our own problems. All we see is us. And it doesn't mean that our problems are real. That when you can start to see other people's problems and start to empathize with people and pray for people and to just love people even when they're actually being difficult. Then we start to get unity. Then we start to be a church. The second thing that he says, and this is, if you want anything for the, the letter of Romans, is this. Paul understood what it meant to preach the gospel. This phrase, this phrase, and some people have, they think that it is the only thing 
that a Christian has to do to preach the gospel. And that's not true, but this letter is very much tied up with the preaching of the gospel. Paul understood that it's through the word and the spirit that people are saved. He understood that. And he understood that it was the message of the cross that changed people's lives. When Jesus hung on that cross, he made a way for you and me, for the whole world, to be reconciled back to God. And he continually refers back to the Old Testament, he refers back to what he has been brought up through. You know the thing that really jumps out at me, he, he puts forward this picture of Jesus. And he says, this is a man that was from the line of David. This was a man that in his human form was a Jew, but not just a Jew, he's from the line of David. The King, King David. In his human nature, one of his dual natures, he was descended from the greatest king of Israel, King David. But he goes on and he says, but he's also the Son of God. Through the Holy Spirit, through the Spirit of God, he is the Son of God. That's what the gospel is all about. A man who is God. Only he could have broken the curse of sin and death. Only he could have done that. Do you realize that? No one else could have done that. We can't do it. The greatest scientists in the world can't do it. Only Jesus could do it. That's why that's all Paul says. I've got only one thing to say. All I've got is Jesus. All I can tell you is the gospel. All I can tell you is the good news. That's all I've got. But it doesn't mean it's not enough. It's the greatest message that you'll ever hear. That Jesus has the power over sin and death. And that's why we're here, isn't it? Because Jesus has the power over sin and death. Paul is attempting to find some common ground with these believers. He's trying to get them on his side, isn't he? He's trying to partnership, partner with them, and trying to get them on. He's never met them before. And he's trying to create some common ground. And a lot of these ideas have been circulating around you. We, we have in our minds that they all had a Bible. This early church, they all had a Bible and they all knew it wasn't written. They, they may have had some of the Old Testament scriptures, but Paul is putting in writing ideas that have been circulated at the time. And he's trying to get some common ground with them. You know, it's a, it's a lesson for us. You know, when you see some people cheering their faith, they just go straight for the jungle, don't they? You're a sinner, and you're going to die in your sin, and you're going to go to hell. It's not a great start, is it, let's be honest. Whereas some people, they find some common ground. They start a conversation. And maybe they'll even start a friendship, have a coffee, have a chat. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what he's done for me. That's a teacher isn't it? That's sharing Jesus with people. And you might think, well, maybe the first way is more powerful. It's not more powerful. Paul shows us that. We have to find common ground with people, don't we? We have to get on people's way of life. And that's hard. We know it's hard. And it takes time and commitment. But that's what we're called to do. To befriend those people that need Jesus. It's easy to say those words and walk away and say, you're a sinner, tough luck. You know what you're saying? But we're called to love people, aren't we? We're called to love people, connect with people. 
So here we have Paul, the apostle, the impossible apostle. This is a man trying to destroy the church. How is he an apostle? It makes no sense. Until you realize that Jesus is in the business of turning enemies into followers. You were all his enemies once. Do you realize that? You were all his enemies once. When we were lost in our sin. Going our own way. Old fashioned teaching I know. But we were all there. Well maybe not all there. <laughs> Jesus is in the business of turning enemies into followers. Isn't that amazing? How many people do that? As, as human beings, we turn enemies into greater enemies, don't we? That's what we do. We just like, well, okay, well, they won't be friendly with us, but we won't be friendly with them. <laughs> That's how we do it, isn't it? We, we, we'll just mess up the ante, let's do something, let's, okay, what can we do? Let's be more inventive. <laughs> it's human nature, isn't it? It's what we do, we just think, okay, you know, you got that, that neighbor that's, that maybe, you know, maybe they do something that's not very, that's not very good. And you just think, okay, what can I do to really wipe them out? <laughs> Come on, don't tell me we've never thought of it. <laughs> Tuning enemies into followers. It's a great miracle, isn't it? How does he do that? How does he do that? And there's one word, love. Love wins over everything. And we've seen this in conflict. You notice that when the, very often when conflicts come to an end, there has to be a time. Remember in South Africa when Nelson Mandela took over and he said we need a time. They were, people were calling for riots and deaths and, also, and bloodshed. He said there is only one way out of this. There is only one way out of this, and it's through reconciliation with each other. There is only one way out. You can't say that it's going in a particularly good direction at the moment as a country, but at that moment in time, he got it. He got it that love conquers all. Love conquers all. You're here because Jesus loves you. The Apostle Paul was in ministry because Jesus loved him. He called him. He stopped him. And he said, Saul, what are you doing? Why are you persecuting me? Is it something we don't understand? When we hurt another Christian, we hurt Jesus. Do you realize that? When we hurt one another, we hurt Jesus. When we persecute one another, we persecute Jesus. That's how connected we are to Jesus. He loved you so much, he died for you. And Paul is doing what he's doing because of the love of God. This miraculous thing. Don't ever think you're not good enough. Don't ever think that you are outside of God's love. It's not true. Don't think you can't live up to his standards. Do you know what his standards are? Be my child, follow me. Is that that hard? Is it that hard? Sometimes it is, isn't it? And do you know why? Because the society that we live in tells us to look after number one. Look after number one. You have cameras, they're called selfie. See the, cam the, the, the camera on your phone? It's called a selfie camera. And you see all the social media people with their selfies telling everyone what they have for their tea. <laughs> <laughs> with their filters and their. What does Paul say? Let me show you a more excellent way. It's what he's saying. Let me show you a better way of living. A better way of viewing the world. Because the way that you're viewing the world at the moment is broken. Rome as an empire fell. Didn't fall at this time. It's like 400 years later. It came to an end. Since every empire comes to an end. Everything that man makes eventually fails. A 
And we put so much of our confidence in what man has done, in what each of us does, in our education, in our work, whatever it is, in our families. There is only one that will never fail you. And it's Jesus. It's the same name. We keep saying the same person. It is Jesus. He is worthy. Why would you not want to attach yourself to him? He will get you through to the end. But you have to trust him. Believe in him. And follow him. It's all he asks you. And he'll clean you up along the way. Because as you follow along, some of the things that you do ain't going to work anymore. They might work now, but at some point Jesus is going to say, you need to leave that behind. Because that can't get with us anymore. It's slowing us down. And some of you have got stuff in your life and you need to lay it down. Because it's stopping you following to where God wants you to go next. This man was on an amazing mission from God. The reality is, he goes to Jerusalem and he's arrested. Fourth missionary journey never happens. And yet this letter has lasted the test of time. Here we have it in our Bible. It's amazing. Most of the New Testament is written by Paul, this man. This, this reject. You ever felt rejected? Cast off? Put aside? You ever felt like that? Like the world is passing you by? Paul didn't let it stop him. Because he trusted Jesus. He didn't trust what he could see. He trusted the person that he was following. We are called to walk by faith and not by sight. Faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus. And one day he will deliver us into his holy presence. Imagine that. Seeing Jesus like, ah, oh, that's what you want me. I thought you were going to the guy on TV. Yeah. <laughs> we can have a shock, can we? We can have a shock, we're like, oh, right, that's what you want me. Right. We are called to follow him. And we're called to listen when he tells us to leave stuff behind. I think that's enough for this morning. We're going to leave that with you. I'm just going to pray. If you've got some stuff you need to leave behind, do it now. Why? Because we're moving into a new season. And it's going to slow you down. It's going to slow me down, I can assure you. It's going to slow you down. And if you want to keep up, you need to let it go. And I don't know what that is. I don't know whether it's a pain from your past. I don't know whether it's a sin in your life. I don't know what it is, but you've got to let it go. Maybe someone's hurt you. We hurt each other all the time. Let it go. Put it down. It's too heavy. And where we're going is exciting. Because we're going into fertile ground. Do you realize that? Fertile ground. Are you coming with me? You ready to fight? I hope you are. I don't be honest. <laughs> but if you're not, I'll do it on my own. I promise you, I'll do it on my own. But I know you will. I know that. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you turn your enemies into your followers, into your family. And Father, we just pray this morning. All of the things that are slowing us down, Lord, help us to just put it down, just bring it to the altar, to bring it to you. As we pray now, as we consider now our lives and where we're at, Lord God, help us to lay it down. Because it's going to slow us down, we know that, and help us to attach ourselves to you. To your will, to your purpose, your plan. As you lead us into food our ground. Lord God, we just thank you that you have not rejected us. We may be rejected by everybody else, but you have not rejected us, and you love us, and we are your people. And Lord, we love you. 
Jesus, we love you. And Father, we pray that you lead us in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name.